Yeah. Just tell us how you actually got in touch with the, the mighty page and plant machine. Well, um, what was it? Um, I was driving around London with my business card. Uh, Nigel Eaton, hurdy gurdy player, desperate for a session, honestly. Could have done with the work big time. And I just w w drove around all the recording studios and put my card in. And um, cosmically, Robert was thinking about having a hurdy gurdy player on Fate of Nation at the time. And um, of course, I only just so he sent his tech out to find a hurdy gurdy player, sort of scratching his head. Oh, yeah. What the hell is that? You know. And the girl behind the set desk said, "Oh, here you go. This guy's just come in." I was I was back in the studio within, within about an hour to see Fate of Nations. And what what was it like meeting Robert Plant? I mean, why had he decided, for example, that he wanted a hurdy gurdy player? Um, I don't know. I mean, Jimmy Jimmy owned a hurdy gurdy back in 1968. He was probably one of the first people to know what they were. Jimmy Page. Yeah, really? he's got a really old one, um, which doesn't work. He's got a good one now. Yeah. And uh, you sorted him out. I did. Well, my dad did. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, it was just weird. De dead weird, you know. And I mean, decidedly once he won, and I'd just been in. Yeah. Um, and we did these, did these couple of tracks on the Hurdy Gurdy, which didn't go particularly well for me. Um, and then blow me down, they phoned me up and asked me to do the MT MTV thing. So it was a complete surprise after that initial Yeah, I thought, on the CV, you know, yeah. Robert Plant. <laughs> and yeah. uh, that was the end of that. And, uh, and so there you were at the scene of the... Uh, uh, basically, the unofficial Led Zeppelin reunion. Yeah. What was that like? Um, bizarre in the extreme. Um, I mean, I, I know they'd always had interest in folk music uh, and occasionally heard it goes through Jimmy's interest in cosmic instruments. And uh, there I was playing these hurdy gurdy things. I mean, possibly if they'd, if they, if Jimmy's hurdy gurdy had worked in, back in '68, there would have been hurdy gurdy on. Zep 2, 3, and yeah. 4, and God well, knows what else. Zep 3, they could have certainly yeah, fitted for in sure. There. Yeah, and then there's Battle of Evermore. Which, um, you which, play. Sound, which sounds great, and Gallus yeah. Poets, a folk tune anyway. Yeah. Um, so it all went great for, um, for me. Do they tell you what to play? I mean, you've, uh, you're one no, of No, they've pretty well left me to do them. what I wanted. Yeah. Um, I, I just come up with an occasional rift, a riff and uh, blast my way through Gallus Pole, and they've, they've yet to say they don't like it. So. I mean, they're quite into hurdy gurdy still. I mean, after the tour's been going since February. And they're still into hurdy gurdies. I thought they might have moved on to Guatemala and Gongs or something yeah, by now, but they're yeah. still very keen on hurdy gurdies. And um, how about the audiences? Um, I mean, you've played all over the world. Now. We have, what, yeah. I mean, how does it go? You, well, you know where I started from. It's like folk bands. Yeah, you played and, in folk bands, yeah. Yeah, in folk festivals to about 30 people, and now it's like thousands of 30,000, you know. Yeah. Um, it's actually easier than you might think. I always wondered how pop stars actually managed to get on stage and do yeah. their thing. But it's um, actually quite straightforward, and I wasn't nervous at, at all when Eddie Gay's been, hasn't let me down, but the audience are jumping. I mean, they spend most of the time going, what on earth is yeah. that, you know? And then you've got this monstrous, drone, devilish sort of thing going, yeah. coming out of it, so nobody knows if I play a bum note or anything. Right. It's just well, now, that's, very weird. That's a very, yeah. that's a very good cue to talk about the instrument. I mean, yeah. a lot of people will never have, they might have heard of a hurdy-gurdy, but they probably don't know what it is. Just to explain it, show, it, show um, us how it works. Well, it, uh, they, they date back to the 10th century, so they're medieval. Wow. Um, in churches, you get um, hurdy-gurdy players, um, sort of angels playing, playing hurdy-gurdy's carved yeah. in the walls and everything. Then in the same church, you'll have a picture of a, a devil or something playing hurdy so yeah. It's quite a contradiction with them. Um, but the way it works is quite straightforward. If you imagine it on your shoulder there, um, it works very much like a violin, so the bow going across the um, strings. You've got a handle which turns the wheel Right, and there's nothing inside, it's just an empty box. Mm -hmm. And the wheel will turn continuously and drone, and drone and play all the strings that are put into contact with it. Instead of the fingers on the fingerboard right. here, you've got keys, two octaves, so you can play pretty well any tune. Um, except that it's limited, of course, that it's got drones going through it all the time, which right. just makes it peculiar to itself. Or like, right, a, or like bag a bagpipe, exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, so is this like, th this is a French instrument originally, it's a Breton instrument? Well, nobody really knows. They date back to the 10th century and nobody uh, sort of knows exactly where. But they're thought to be Central European yeah. and developed within 100 years of each other yeah. in lots of different places. As soon as you decide to have a, um, an instrument with a wheel, instead of plucking it or yeah. bowing it, the instrument's going to end up looking something like this. Um, so I'll, I'll turn the handle and sh make more sense. Um, it's a bass drone. Yeah. They just that's like a bagpipe drone or something, except it's a string, of course, yeah. it's a bow. Oh god, you can see this. You can see that string one. String going absolutely yeah. wild, yeah. Um, and did you a, did you start playing this? I mean your father makes these instruments. Yeah. Is there any other reason why you took up with it? Well it was a very good uh, way of not going to my cello lessons <laughs> at the time, which I was completely <laughs> useless at, and Dad um uh, presented me with this. And yeah. that was the deal, really. Yeah. And I, I watched him make them for a year. He took forever to build the first one. Yeah. And when you watch your dad build something completely stupid, you think, yeah. oh, 
yeah, you sort of understand how it's supposed to work. I mean, I got bored in the end waiting. I built yeah. a little one of my own, which I sort of learned to play on. And Dad presented me with this sort of monstrous, yeah. all singing, all dancing, early gaily. It's great the way that the history of pop rock music is almost like the flight from learning to play classical instruments, as, as yeah, you've done brilliantly. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. And I was playing piano, and, but I, honestly, I wasn't getting anywhere, to be honest. Anyway, Nigel, thanks very much for coming in and showing this wonderful instrument. In a moment, you can see Nigel on video doing his thing with Page and Plant, but first, here he is on our state-of-the-art studio doing it just for us on stage.